does arts and humanities signify? A layman's understanding of arts and humanities would mean certain academic disciplines. See, that is how we understand arts and humanities. Certain academic disciplines, certain subjects uh, that are uh, being taught, uh, which study the various aspects of mankind, culture, civilization. Uh, these are some of the ways in which a layman would understand arts and humanities. But uh, when we try to articulate it, maybe I think it would be more profitable to understand arts and humanities by having a better idea of what it is not. There was a time, especially during uh, the Renaissance, when this term arts and humanities was contrasted, contrasted, it was considered as something opposed to divinity. Arts and humanities as the opposite of divinity during the Renaissance. Today, usually arts and humanities are contrasted with the sciences and the social sciences, what we call the STEM subjects, the science, uh, the science and technology, engineering and mathematics. So that is the way today we understand arts and humanities. And when you, if you would ask an academic, an academician, how would you define arts and humanities? He would probably say it is an education, an education that befits a cultivated man. So evidently, the academic orientation of arts and humanities as a subject area cannot be overstated. And this academic meaning of arts and humanities can be traced back to liberal arts education and humanism. And what I'm trying to tell you is, when you look at the meaning of arts and humanities, maybe it would be profitable uh, to trace it through the evolution of liberal arts education and humanism. I'm sure most of us are familiar with humanism, but what is this liberal humanism? See, when we look at uh, the major isms and the theories that evolved and mushroomed in the late 20th and early 21st century, uh, we can very clearly understand that those theories uh, express a kind of dissatisfaction and antagonism towards these complex of ideologies known as liberal humanism. So all the theories, almost all the theories that we have in the 20th, late 20th and early 21st century, they are against liberal humanism. Why this antagonism? And why, what is this liberal humanism? What is the characteristic of liberal humanism that has attracted so much antagonism? To understand liberal humanism, it would uh, definitely be a profitable exercise to look at humanism. I, I think uh, some audios are on. Could you please mute the audio? Thank you. OK, so what is humanism? What do we mean by humanism? A man-centered rather than a God-centered view of the universe is known as humanism. Man-centered rather than God-centered. In simple terms, it is a complete and total devotion to human interests. The humanists considered man as the crown of creation, the Christian notion of man being the crown of creation. And uh, if I can say, humanists worshipped man. So what is liberal education? What is liberal in liberal humanities? Liberal education provides a great opportunity for the members of a society to become literate, to have critical thinking, 
to be compassionate, to be thoughtful citizens of the world. So liberal, the liberal in liberal humanities is about certain values, values like the ability to think critically, to be compassionate, to be thoughtful, to be citizens of the world, to be global citizens. This is what we understand by liberal. So uh, put together, when we amalgamate, when we try to blend this liberal with humanism, we can understand that liberal humanism would mean something like uh, a, a humanitarian version of humanism, if I can say so. A humanitarian version of humanism. And it, it gives the promise of cooperation and sustainable coexistence within the human species. I guess I'm getting too abstract. Uh, see, uh, let us think about it in very simple terms. Liberal humanism believes that any human crisis can be solved by human being himself. So there is no need to take recourse to any divine powers, any supernatural powers, nothing. Man is capable and it is within the capability of a human being to solve all the crises that he encounters. Today, humanity encounters a great crisis and a liberal humanist would say, don't worry, man has the ability to solve this crisis as well liberal humanism and when i say they never take recourse to religion or divinity and not saying they are against god no the liberal humanists never challenged or questioned the authority or supremacy of god rather liberal humanism views religious beliefs as personal and private Religious belief. I may have a religious belief. No problem. It is my personal choice. It is my private thing. Liberal humanists have no problem with that. So when you look at religion from this perspective, when you look at things from this perspective, uh, we can say religious figures like Prophet Muhammad or Jesus Christ, liberal humanists would say that Jesus Christ or Muhammad are humanist philosophers who taught our species softer codes of behavior. For what purpose? To enable us better adapt to the changing times. Change is inevitable. And these prophets, these people, Christ, Prophet Muhammad, these people for a humanist are humane philosophers who taught humanity to be soft, to be compassionate, so as to adapt better to the challenging times or the changing times. As uh, the critic Catherine Belsey would say in her uh, very famous book, The Subject of Tragedy, she says, liberal humanism is a commitment. It is a commitment to what? A commitment to man whose essence is freedom. A commitment to man whose essence is freedom. In other words, liberal humanism is a liberative principle which emancipated or rescued in, in within courts, which emancipated or rescued or liberated humanities from the stranglehold of God, religion, or divinity. So is it against religion again? How? Why? What am I saying? See, uh, to get a perspective of liberal humanities, you know, uh, to see the, we have to see the larger picture. When we closely, you know, scrutinize the evolution of modes of thoughts, of philosophy, we can understand that liberal humanism is a transition from what? It's a, liberal humanism is a transition from traditionalism to romanticism. So you can place liberal humanism as something 
that facilitated the transition from traditionalism to romanticism. Now I'm trying to say something which would make more sense, not so abstract. I would try to make it more concrete so that uh, we can get into the lecture better. So what is this traditionalism? Of course, I would be uh, doing a lot of generalization of ob obviously uh, I have to complete my lecture within 45 minutes. Uh, but of course, uh, our lecture is not expected to wander and meander through uh, various other fields. No, that is not the idea. So let us look at traditionalism and we can understand one thing. It was in traditionalism that the concept of God took shape. I would say traditionalism is about the birth of God and a faith in God to solve all human crises. I was telling you about how humanity, humanism would uh, look at human being as the solution to all human crises. Traditionalism said that, yes, we have a God, a loving God, and God is the solution to all our problems. That was traditionalism. Romanticism, on the other hand, as something you know uh, we understand romanticism as something very beautiful we when when we are when we are told about romanticism we think of Keats and Shelley and uh, a lot of emotion passion but when we look at romanticism from a strictly philosophic point of view we will know that romanticism proclaimed the death of God and the birth of the author, the death of God and the birth of the author. You will do remember. You will do well to remember Nietzsche's famous statement that God is dead, and there is an anecdote which says that Nietzsche wrote, "God is dead" on his wall, on the wall of his, uh, on the wall outside his house. Nietzsche wrote, "God is dead," and. When Nietzsche died, somebody wrote beneath that inscription, somebody wrote, uh, Nietzsche is dead, God. Above, God is dead, Nietzsche. And below, Nietzsche is dead, God. Anyway, so this was the romantic idea. God is dead. And instead of focusing on the deaths of God, they focused more on the births of the author. And it was during this phase that we witnessed, of course, it is uh, when we speak about literary history or uh, history of uh, uh, Britain, we think of uh, Victorian age. But it is a continuation of what happened in Romanticism. We, saw, we see the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species in 1859. And this book, the publication of On the Origin of the Species, dealt a major blow to the very foundation of organized religion. People like Matthew Arnold, he was a teacher, his father was a teacher too. People like Matthew Arnold argued that literature and poetry must fill the vacuum created by the absence of religion, literature and poetry. What is it? It represents the author. So Romanticism spoke about the death of, the, death of God and the birth of the author. Broadly speaking, structuralism followed. And what did the structuralists say? They made it, the structuralists, they made it very clear that the human being is neither the originator nor the destroyer of meaning. Man is not the originator or the destroyer of meaning. They said, the structuralists said, they made it very clear that it is the system that produces meaning. Meaning is a product of the system. And they gave the famous example of a ball pushed between two posts, football. 
you know, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if you are going to tell a novice how to play football, the basic thing that you would be telling him or her would be, you just go ahead and push that ball between the two posts and you will score a goal. Please turn off the videos, please, Duto. Uh, could you please turn off the video? Uh, so, uh, so uh, that is the way we understand football. Then what happened? To push a ball between the two posts. But when a person enters the football ground, he sees not two, but four posts. Two posts there and two posts here behind two posts behind you and two posts uh, opposed to you and you understand that you have to push the ball through that two posts against you to score a goal but what if this person thinks that i can score a goal by pushing this ball between that one post and this one post these are also two posts here are two posts, there are two posts. Here is one post, there is another post. So if I can push the ball between those two posts, uh, that would be a goal. Would it be a goal? No, we know it is not a goal. So what am I saying? This is what the structuralist said. It, it can, uh, somebody has the video turned on. Uh, could you please turn off the video, Tutor Mohan? Could you please turn off the video? Uh, okay. So this is what structuralism said. System produces meaning. It is the system. It is the post that decides whether something is a goal or not. Man is neither the producer nor the destroyer of meaning. And then came post-structuralism. For, for, for a layman, post-modernism. And post-structuralism announced the death of the author and the birth of the reader. So I was talking to you about the death of God, the birth of the author. Now I'm speaking about the death of the author and the birth of the reader. I'm sure you are familiar with uh, Roland Barthes' famous essay uh, titled The Death of the Author, where he famously says that the death of the, 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 the birth of the reader must happen at the cost of the death of the author. Death of the author and the birth of the reader. And now, in this 21st century, what is happening? We saw the theory wars. We saw after theory and against theory, post theory. We have reached the world of pandemic studies and pandemic literature. We have reached the world of post-humanism, post-humanism, after humanism, uh, which emphatically announces the death of man. I'm sure you would disagree with that. Post-humanism isn't about the death of man, but I would, let me try to explain my position. The post-humanist theory claims to offer an epistemology that is never anthropocentric. And therefore, it is not centered in Cartesian dualism. Post-humanism seeks to undermine the traditional boundaries. It's a, it's a subversion. It tries to undermine the traditional boundaries between, between the human the animal and the technological. And I'm sure now you can see the picture, the human, we, who are in lockdown, in, who are quarantined at home, institutionally quarantined, the human, the animal. Yeah, there, there, there is a, a, a confusion whether a virus is a, a living thing or a non-living thing. Some say it is not. It is a DNA, RNA. Uh, anyway, the animal, and the technological, and the technological. These are the three players today, the human, the virus, and the technology. And definitely the human has taken a back seat. I'm sure you would agree that clutching a mouse, clutching a mouse, we live in fear. 
in a wireless world that has come to a standstill thanks to a virus or the wireless is our answer to the virus but is it an answer is it an answer does post humanism give us something bright or is it something bleak that is staring at us as the arts and humanities teachers what is is it something frightening that awaits us in this post humanist world what does this mean to a teacher from the arts and humanities i would like to make certain prognostications and for that i would like to invite your attention to the title of a very famous speech given by chief seattle the chief of the red indians he has he, uh, that that famous speech is titled the end of living and the beginning of survival so life of an academic during this pandemic can be akin to the end of living and if there is a post pandemic world for an academic that would be the beginning of survival the end of living and the beginning of survival so my second the second part of my lecture tries to look at the end of living during this pandemic so what is happening let us look at the the the, the practical side of things look at the prognostications the signs of the times are very clear what is post humanism telling us we were talking about uh, the birth and death of god we were talking about the birth and death of the author we spoke about the birth of the reader now what is post of the human as the teacher and the birth of technology as the new teacher as the new savior technology is our new savior all along i was telling you anything that is at the center is the solution to the crisis that humanity faces now the academy is projecting technology as the solution as the panacea for all our problems in other words technology is the new savior and who is dying who is giving way to technology the teacher let us let us be clear about it it is the teacher who is giving way uh, to technology how my dear friends we are going to be voice recordings we are going to be video recordings right in future say 10 years hence what might happen would the parents be happy uh, to send their students to, to send their kids uh, to the schools and colleges if there is a pandemic situation if there is a some other if there is some other situation which is not com 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 comfortable would the parents be happy to send their uh, watch to send their kids to the schools and colleges no they will be happy uh, having them inside their homes inside the comforts of their living rooms listening or attending webinars attending webinars and those will those days it won't be live webinars those will be recordings students would be listening to recordings the teacher would end up being a recording you know something else also might happen the end of institutionalization of teaching i see that happening i don't know uh, if everybody would agree with me but the institutionalization of teaching is being threatened by this technological uh, you know whatever is happening in the academy uh, because of this you know bombarding of technology luigi pirandello the famous playwright he wrote a play titled 
six characters in search of an author. I won't be surprised if very soon we will be hearing about six teachers in search of a student, or 60 teachers in search of a student, or 600 teachers in search of a student. What will happen? Quality. Now, teachers are a given. A student doesn't have choice. When he is admitted to a school or a college, the teachers who are teaching there are going to teach him. He cannot choose which teacher should teach him. But if there is an option, definitely students would choose, or the parents of students, the stakeholders would choose a teacher who has quality. And then teachers won't be in an institution. I'm not saying that an institutional uh, teaching would end completely, but more and more it is going to happen. The end of living for a teacher. The teacher would have to go in search of students. You know, uh, when we think about the medical profession, earlier we have heard from our parents that those days the doctors used to come to the homes of the patients to treat them. So uh, the hospital used to come to, the, to our homes to give you treatment. Now we have the hospitals as institutions, and you have to go to those institutions to get treatment, to get treated. But now again, the medical profession is witnessing another paradigm shift where, with telemedicine and things like that. But what I'm saying is such a, a, such a shift can happen in education as well. Now students come to the educational institutions, to the teachers, then in future, the teacher may have to go in search of the student. This is one important thing that we have to be wary of. I don't say it is important for us to remain teachers because nature is a great experimenter and whoever survives is the winner. So none of us is inevitable. We cannot say that the teacher is a must because we are teachers. We cannot say that. But there is something called the human element which we cannot avoid. And that is where we still stand a chance. And coming to the third part of my lecture, I would like to look at the beginning of survival post-pandemic. Post-pandemic. If ever there is a post-pandemic world, how would it be like for an academic, for an academician, for a teacher from the arts and humanities, how would it be to live in a post-pandemic world? I would say, how can the arts and humanities teacher prevent complete annihilation and extinction? Annihilation and extinction of the teacher. We know some, some species that got extinct, the dinosaur. We have to, I would say, we have to, we the teachers in the arts and humanities will have to tame the dinosaur of our mind, the mental dinosaur. What is that? Why did the dinosaurs got extinct? We can say it couldn't change according to the changing times changing according to the requirements of the times. That is something required for survival. The dinosaur could not do that, and so it became extinct. There are dinosaurs in our minds, the dinosaur of the mind. So we have to tame and take care of that dinosaur of the mind. We have to embrace and accept change. Change is universal. We cannot deny change. We cannot afford to have homeostasis. What is homeostasis? Sociology. They, they speak about homeostasis, the tendency uh, of a person uh, to, to be suspect about anything that is new, anything that is strange, is homeostasis. But 
we do not have that option to be homeostatic. We cannot be circumspect because if we don't adapt and change, we will be left behind as dinosaurs. We will go extinct. In an evolving universe, one who stands still moves backward. So we have to move forward. And for that, we have to adapt and adopt technology. There are not many choices. The second thing that a teacher from the arts and humanities can do for his own betterment is to go interdisciplinary. I want to, uh, I mean, there is a story, there is not a story actually, something that actually happened. In 2006, American, a team of neurosurgeons in the United States of America, they invited the Formula One Ferrari technicians to the hospital. We don't know why, right? The neurosurgeons inviting the Ferrari technicians. But what happened was uh, the neurosurgeons later confessed that this was a very profitable enterprise that helped them understand the importance of time and uh, importance of doing certain things in a systematic manner far better. And this exercise, which brought together something which had very little in common, yoked by violence together, neuroscience and sport, neuro uh, surg surgery and F1, Formula One uh, racing car technicians, it helped neurosurgery a great deal. So there is that opportunity for us to learn. And going interdisciplinary isn't always something bad. It is challenging, but it is very exciting as well. But we shouldn't fall into the trap of making the humanities scientific in order to survive. No, that is not what is expected of us. We shouldn't make humanities scientific to, be, uh, to survive in a science and technology driven world. No, we have to keep our identity here. What I mean by interdisciplinarity is about a broadening of our horizons, a widening of our perspectives to include other, other species of knowledge, other spheres of human activity. And the third thing, that a teacher from the arts and humanities have to uh, think about is to improve quality. There is no substitute for quality. And if you are a quality teacher, if you have quality, you will never go out of demand. The teacher, the teacher may go out of the institution, but the teacher won't go out of the minds and the hearts of the students as long as he has quality and commitment. I'm not speaking about quality in terms of knowledge alone. I'm speaking about quality in terms of values as well. Lastly, fourthly, I would say, a teacher from the arts and humanities has to understand the relevance, the purpose, and the inevitability of arts and humanities to stage a comeback, to storm back into the academic scenario, a teacher from the arts and humanities has to understand the power that we, he wields. There is no substitute for arts and humanities. We have to understand that. What am I saying? Let us think about certain very simple examples. I'm speaking about how to make a humanistic statement. Think about webinars. You know, lockdown was uh, imposed in our country on 24th of March. And ever since we have seen uh, uh, a mushrooming and, 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 you know, a bombarding of webinars. This too is a webinar. Uh, OK, so a bombarding of webinars happened. In the beginning, it was a trial. 
these webinars and online conferences, workshops, it was a trial. Then it became a necessity. Why? To survive in the academy, each department in a college has to conduct a webinar. So first webinars were a fashion, a fad, uh, an experiment. Then it became an academic necessity to do a webinar to stay abreast with the trend thanks to a virus that is abroad, let loose, a virus let loose. And from that necessity, academic necessity, we are now moving to some other necessity. Look at the kind of titles that they have for webinars these days. Mental health in times of COVID. Mental health during lockdown. How to cope with the stress of a lockdown? What is happening? They are telling us the webinar, the topics of webinars are slowly changing. From an academic necessity, webinars have become a human necessity to learn how to cope with the psychological stresses of a lockdown. The earlier webinars happened because of a virus gone crazy. Now webinars are going to happen because of minds going crazy. The minds of human beings are going crazy. People are getting psychotic, sitting at home. Humanistic interpretation. Arts and humanities, right? You know, it required a national lockdown to make us understand the mental anguish involved in social distancing and quarantine. Someone, uh, Surender sir, could you please turn off your video and audio, please? Surender sir, could you please turn off? The, the lecture is going on, please. OK, so it required a national lockdown for us to understand the mental suffering involved in social distancing and quarantine. When did, when did it actually happen? We saw massive student protests, didn't we? On the streets of Delhi, massive student protests against sterner quarantines imposed on the Kashmiris. It didn't move our hearts. Nor did the sporadic outbreaks of violent protests across the northeastern states. It didn't move us. It was their business. We didn't care. But now we know how bad it is to be locked down and locked up, to be in social distancing, how mentally tough it is. The role of arts and humanities in Telling the world the truth, telling the world what it ought to see. And my dear friends, the suicide of a celebrity opened our eyes and hearts to the need for being empathetic and caring. Right? A suicide of a celebrity. He committed suicide and now everybody is worried what is going to happen. Okay, we have to care, we have to listen to others. But my dear friends, thousands and thousands of farmers committed suicide the last many years. Did it move us? Why? These are the questions that only humanities and the arts can ask. Why? Why? A counter narrative to what we are being told. This is the duty of the arts and humanities. I am not making a political statement. I'm not making a political statement. I was not making a political statement either. I wanted to make a human statement. I wanted to make a humanistic statement and I am making a humanistic statement. Arts and humanities have to help us to be the citizens of the world. It would help us to have what Thomas Lacker called a moral imagination. 
that would allow us to regard the suffering of distant humans as making the same sort of claim on us as the suffering of proximate ones, not just the suffering of those near and dear to us, but the suffering of those far away from us, the migrant laborers. You know what happened. Uh, what happened when Arundhati Roy spoke about Islamophobia? We know what happened. Uh, we see our friend uh, Tenzin Sundu going crazy uh, on channels. He's so passionate. How he speaks about banned China products. Again, these are not political statements. He's a poet. He's a writer. He's an activist. Arundhati Roy, she's an activist too. Humanities, arts, making human statements. Somebody should speak somewhere. Otherwise, yeah, time to conclude. Uh, thank you. OK, so ultimately, we need the arts and humanities to make human, humane statements. This then would be the legacy of the arts and humanities in the post-pandemic world if ever there will be one. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. I guess we will have a question answer session or an interaction session. Yes, sir. We will now uh, have an interactive session. I mean, uh, we will open the floor for questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Manumangachi, for talking, speaking us through the history of humanities and the theory. Uh, thank you. Your lecture has truly inspired us to think critically on the post-human and post-pandemic world. As Thank you me. observed earlier in your speech, the relevance of theory in such a world is certainly brought under increased scrutiny. While fiction help, helps us imagine the world in the subjective mode, that is the world not as it is, but as if it were, theory helps us understand the world that we live in. I'm sure our, our faculty enjoyed the lecture and doubly sure they have several questions to ask you. I would like to open the floor to questions now. Um, yeah, those of us who have questions may please unmute their mic and ask the question. Yes, please. Hello. Has everybody gone to sleep? <laughs> Please feel yeah. free to ask me because it is like uh, asking questions to your students in a class. I am so young. I am so uh, ignorant. So you can ask questions as you uh, as you, you are so eminent teachers. Definitely, you can ask me questions as you ask your students. Thank you. I think I think Padma Kumar is ready with a question. Go ahead, Padma. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Manu, sir. Uh, it was uh, a pleasure listening to you. Uh, a lot of uh, you, interesting insights and uh, very cogently present arguments. Thank uh, you, sir. I enjoyed uh, listening to your lecture. Uh, I just had one question with regard to the technology uh, stance that you seem to have been uh, seem to be taking. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, uh, you were uh, positioning it as though our technology is attempting to be the center, uh, quite like the way in which God was presented to be the center of all debates. Uh, meaning making processes and later uh, the human was pre uh, posi positioned there and then the structure and so on and so forth right now uh, yes, my contestation is uh, technology is just like a, a facade I, I don't think that is the uh, center i still money uh, and uh, capitalism is at the center and technology is the uh, way of presenting uh, things like for example when you talk about spacex or for the matter uh, uh, Microsoft, uh, there is uh, Elon Musk and uh, his uh, capitalist interest, and so is it with regard to Bill Gates and uh, his interest, right? So, uh, I think uh, uh, we need to uh, call out the elephant in the room, uh, and uh, technology might seem to be. Uh, I mean, uh, people are probably going along the techno solutionist route. I, I get what you're uh, conveying, but uh, the uh, engine, uh, the driving force, seems to be still uh, a very crony capitalist. Absolutely, sir. I, uh, I, I agree with you, actually. 
uh, it is uh, the capitalist corporate mentality that is uh, you know driving this uh, tech crazy world and uh, if we say that technology is going to dominate our world it is another way of saying we are giving in to capitalism and corporate interests i, I definitely agree with you uh, you know the ugc speaks about having moocs and democratization of the education system having distance education but ultimately what might happen what might happen it's not the case of a university as eminent as christ but think about the other universities which do not have that much of an in infrastructural facility and things like that what might happen is education might fall into the wrong hands higher education in the country could fall into the hands of the corporates whose uh, i mean one of their biggest aims could be private profit making so uh, you are spot on sir or what what you said is absolutely correct what we see as technology uh, it is as actually somebody else the capitalist masquerading as uh, the technologist it is a mask of conquest that we need to unmask uh, even in these days of wearing those masks right thank you thank you very much thank you sir Uh, if anyone else has a question, please ask. We are open for questions now. If, uh, Deepak sir, is it okay if I follow up with one more question? Is that okay? Uh, yes, sir. Not an issue. Uh, oh, please. Okay. Sir, um, uh, I uh, really like the way in which you set up uh, the problem and uh, what needs to be done. Uh, but uh, could you give me, uh, I mean, could you give us uh, some kind of a direction with regard to what uh, ought to be the agenda for the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, given the kind of predicament that we are in. Um, so the changing world is, uh, I mean, uh, you did mention uh, that we need to go interdisciplinary, that uh, we, uh, we do uh, uh, need to adapt and adopt uh, technology, and that uh, uh, we need to rise the quality. I get all of that. Uh, but then uh, the forces that we are uh, encountering, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, how do I put it, I mean, uh, facing, uh, uh, are uh, so huge and uh, they set the agenda and we usually end up responding uh, i mean uh, reacting uh, so uh, how do we change this dynamics i mean uh, where where would uh, I mean, how do we bring in our creative and uh, uh, let's say our uh, hum humanist uh, interest into the picture and uh, take charge of the scenario and uh, uh, decide the course of action exactly sir uh, that is an issue Recently, I heard uh, a lecture by uh, Dr. Pramod Kinnair, and there he too was uh, mentioning a similar idea. When he, uh, when he was saying that, uh, you know, when policy decisions are made, they are not going to invite the head of the departments of the arts and humanities stream. No, uh, we, we won't be invited to make any policy decision or anything. But what I think is, the problem with the humanities, it is actually not a problem. It is, uh, it is uh, the characteristic of humanities that it is uh, the foundational axioms of humanities are not quantifiable. But unfortunately, we are living in a world where everything has to be presented in numbers. When you speak about uh, the UGC, NAC, AQAR, you know, academic uh, quality assurance report. They want everything in numbers. And how can a humanities department present uh, what it does in numbers? There, there, there is a limitation. A humanities teacher, a humanities department definitely faces a limitation when it comes to representing what they have done or what they are doing. So this is a crisis for humanities, but we have to stick to uh, the basic things that humanities is. It is about critical thinking. It is about evoking and uh, promoting critical thinking among our students. It is about uh, creating a kind of empathetic engagement with the other. And this is something that only the humanities can do. Sciences can do a lot of things, but a kind of empathetic engagement with the other is something that is pro that is 
there only in the province of the arts and humanities. So there has to come such a realization. And it is a fact that students are moving for farther and farther away from uh, the arts and humanities. A study conducted in 97, I know it is uh, slightly outdated, but still it said that uh, compared to 120 years ago, now only 5% of the students and their parents want to go to arts and humanities colleges compared to the 20, 120 years back when 70% of all the college going students went to arts and humanities colleges. So that is the reality. And why, why is this happening? Because we are thinking about outcome based education, job, occupation, getting a job is considered to be the ultimate aim of all education. And that is where we need uh, an awareness and a shift in uh, perspective on the part of uh, the public as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh -huh. Sir, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, Mithilesh, you want to ask something? Yes, sir. If there is time. I... Yeah, yeah. Okay. Make it brief. Huh? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, oh, the question was, uh, I mean, today in the business line, there was uh, on the op-ed page uh, exactly the question that you are addressing about the crisis in humanities and social sciences. Uh, my my question is, uh, is it now um, possible to uh, invoke uh, empathy and um, critical thinking as something which is... Uh, exclusive to arts and humanities. I mean, for example, the claim to critical thinking is also coming from uh, several other uh, ac disciplines. I mean, economics, for example, I mean, uh, uh, people like, uh, you know, who are in critical development studies and so on and so forth, they are actually also laying claim to empathy and social science, uh, empathy and critical thinking. So in that case, when we are competing on funds, we are competing on students and all of that. Uh, how much of uh, a claim to critical thinking and empathy uh, is exclusive to arts and humanities? Thank you. Uh, very true, sir. Uh, it's, it's a problem. Uh, it, it's a problem. And when things are getting interdisciplinary, uh, I feel personally, I feel that it is the humanities who tend to give up Throw in the towel. The best, like all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. I'm not speaking about the sciences or the STEM subjects are as the worst. But I'm what what I'm trying to say is we are sometimes lacking in a little bit of conviction. We need to have that conviction that yes, we can. And what is happening more and more in humanities subjects, in arts and humanities, is we are giving space to the sciences. You know, uh, when, when we look at what is happening in the theoretical fields in arts and humanities, we have uh, an increasingly uh, higher number of scientific disciplines and scientific subjects and science authors whom we are discussing. And uh, the importance of, say, uh, someone like a Shakespeare uh, or, or a Milton is diminishing in the academic curriculum, uh, academic system, and somebody like uh, some philosophers or anthropologists or uh, biologists, those people are increasingly getting into the picture in the humanities and the art subjects. I don't say it is bad, and uh, if the sciences are good enough to uh, to have those things as well that we claim to be uh, our own, then so be it. Then uh, we, we have to concede uh, space to them and agree that the sciences are good to end. Uh, well, what we ultimately require is the betterment of humanity. So whether it is the sciences who do that, whether it is the humanities who do that, uh, let's hope that it's all uh, for the betterment of uh, the human society. Uh, I know I haven't answered, I have only answered the question uh, partially, uh, but I don't think there is a clear cut answer to the question because it is a problem that we have to leave with rather than uh, solve. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Uh, okay, sir. Uh, we have one more question here. Uh, yes, we'll sir. just take this final question. This has been um, like posted by Dr. Abaya NB. So uh, this is a question from Dr. Abaya NB. NB. Uh, the question is: Do you think the nature of being a student and teacher uh, will remain the same post-pandemic world in the post-pandemic world as well? Would you please mm -hmm. answer that question, sir? No way. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's very clear to us, right? Uh, the, the roles of the teacher and, and the roles of the student, uh, everything is going to undergo a sea change. It, it, is, cha it is changing and it has almost changed. Uh, I'm sure the teacher is going to get smaller and smaller. Uh, the, 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 the presence of the teacher in the academic scene is going to get diminished. Uh, the student may have a bigger role to play uh, but obviously, we, we can expect uh, radical changes. It is bound to happen. Uh, if ever there is a post-pandemic world, that world will see a lot of changes. And it is, uh, we cannot even predict what might uh, happen. Uh, because students are coming up with uh, things like the 11th commandment, thou must not COVID thy neighbor. And, uh, you know, teachers are unable to uh, keep up with the pace of such kind of uh, wonderful thinking, I should say. So uh, maybe the teachers will be found wanting because uh, when it comes to technology, the students uh, do things far better than the teachers most of the times because uh, they, they have been, they have uh, seen it all and they have been born and brought up in technology, uh, in, in the uh, in the lap of technology, they were born, so they are in a better, better position to uh, face the challenges that this new world order is going to throw at us than the teachers. So that is why teachers need to evolve and change. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, thank now you, sir. I invite uh, Dr. John Joseph Kennedy, our dean, to deliver the word of thanks. All right, so. Uh, uh, Good evening, everybody. I hope I am audible. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Manu Ngatu, for this wonderful uh, interaction that we've had for the last um, one and a half hours. Uh, it's, it's been very informative. And more than that, it's been um, thought provoking. Uh, it's quite relevant in our context, uh, some of the questions that you have raised. And I'm sure, you know, it's uh, something that our faculty members must uh, seriously uh, start thinking about. Uh, I just uh, would like to uh, reinforce one or two points that you made at the end, uh, whether uh, teachers are really going to become mere recordings in future, whether there is uh, no role for them to play beyond uh, being a recording and uh, how teachers perhaps will have to also take extra efforts to you know reach out to the students in in uh, the backdrop of uh, the pandemic uh, you also talked about uh, how we have uh, started our survival now the end of living uh, has happened now we need to look at survival and very important questions you raised but you also gave us your own solutions and I think these solutions are for us to uh, remember and uh, follow very seriously. One, of course, is uh, accepting the change. It's a very important thing that you mentioned, because very often as teachers, we take many things for granted. But I think, you know, time has come now for us to uh, be ready to adapt to new situations and changes. Second thing you said, interdisciplinarity is a very important thing. Absolutely true. And of course, Lastly, you said uh, we should improve quality and uh, also understand the relevance of our arts and humanities. And uh, we also must realize that uh, it is inevitable that we need to continue as teachers of arts and humanities and how uh, we make it relevant to our society and our students. So it's, it's been a wonderful session. Thank you so much for taking out uh, your own time to spare, you know, this time with us. Uh, because uh, when uh, Mr. Arul brought this to me, 
Uh, I said that would be lovely uh, because, you know, we do have this forum for the Faculty of Arts and Humanities and uh, it would be a nice thing, you know, for us to have somebody from outside come and address this. This is the first online uh, series of our Sangama sessions. And uh, we also have had some people from outside of Christ. Quite a few people have uh, joined the session and uh, I'm sure they also stand to benefit uh, from this session. So on behalf of the Deanery or the School of Arts and Humanities, all the members, all the you know, officials of the university, a big, big thank you to you. And I uh, hope to see you sometime soon. We, we would love to hear you more. And uh, whenever uh, there is an opportunity, uh, Mr. Arul will keep in touch with you and let you know what could be done. Thank you so much on all our behalf. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, the members will remain. We will have a short meeting for about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, or the others uh, may take leave. Uh, uh, the outsiders uh, who don't belong to Christ University Faculty Forum kindly I request you to lead the meeting. Thank you. Deepak? Deepak, are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, could you please uh, make sure that. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, exiting right now. Sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think you, right now. Yeah, you 